You are listening to Talking Hoosier Baseball, a podcast by fans from the iubase.com website for anyone wanting more info on Indiana University baseball. Today is Tuesday, February 12th, 2019. Opening day is only three days away. I am Carl James, joined by stats guru Cassidy Palmer, every umpire's best friend in Chris Feeney, and the creator of iubase.com, Josh Bennett, for our 2019 season preview podcast. We usually start our show out with Hoosier highlights from each of our panelists. We're going to vary that a bit tonight by discussing what each of us is looking forward to for this season. Cassidy, will you get us started? So for me, one of the things I'm really interested in in seeing, especially the first couple of weeks, is how some of the individual players have developed in the offseason, particularly related to working with a new staff, getting a new approach, uh, things like that. Because when I looked at the stats, there were there were some pretty impressive, impressive improvements from 2017 to last year. Uh, On the offensive side, you saw Gorski's batting average go up 23%. His strike rate was down 17%. And his his extra base hit rate almost doubled. It was up 91% from the season before. Gorski had a huge jump last year. So seeing if he can make that same sort of a jump this year, he's easily an All-American. Uh, Feynman, his batting average went up 20% last year. His walk rate was up 10%. Uh, His strikeout rate was down 15%. So he also had a really solid jump from one season to the next. Another interesting one is Scotty Bradley. Uh, Using 2016 as his comparison as he sat out most of 17, his batting average was up 27%. His walk rate, I I don't know that I've seen one like this for a guy who got regular at bats. His walk rate went up 66% from 2016 to 2018. Uh, So seeing some of these guys, how their uh, approach at the plate changes, that will be really interesting. Uh, On the pitching side, uh, Matt Lloyd, his opponent batting average dropped 12% from one season to the next. His ERA was down 31% and his strike rate was up 50%. He did face fewer batters in 2018. So it'll, again, be interesting to see his usage versus his stats. Holly Milto, his ERA was was down 48%. Uh, His percentage of hits that went for extra bases was down 35%. And he faced right around the same number of batters. So his numbers improved across the board. And Cam Beecham, the big one that stands out, his ERA was down 18%, but his walk rate dropped 49%, and his K rate went up 47%. So those two numbers absolutely flip-flopped. And so seeing if that trend continues, I mean, this this could be, not only is it a potent offense, this could be a really talented pitching staff. And so so that's what I'm really interested to see uh, see this season. Josh, how about you? What are you looking forward to? Uh, well, what I'm excited about uh, is that I'm just excited to see the roster finally. Uh, it's always a long wait from watching the fall games to know who will be wearing the cream and crimson come springtime. I know there was some stiff competition. I'm sure some very tough decisions were made. Uh, but I want to thank those who didn't make the roster for all the hard work they put in to play baseball at IU and and. We'll keep following them and wish them the best of luck in their futures. Um, That said, uh, the offense should be dynamic with what's coming back. Um, Some of the new guys coming in. Uh, With only two senior pitchers returning in Lloyd and Milto, I'm looking forward to see how this staff matures and develops under the new coaching staff and and under Ryan Feynman's guidance. Uh, So I'm excited to see that. But uh, Feeney, what what are you looking forward to most this season? For me, it's it's Friday nights. It's Friday nights and the approach we're going to take because there were just too many Friday nights where it just seemed like one guy would just dominate us. You know, it didn't seem like game plans changed during the game. Um, I'm really looking forward to Coach Mercer's approach, the hitting approach. Cassie touched on the possibilities of it, but actually seeing it in action. Um just too many guys, too many guys dominated us on Fridays and put Steve in rough positions. The guy had so much pressure every time he took the mound. 
um, the launch angles, the, the, the new approach that they're going to take. And even those like midweek heavy ball sinker guys where we'd have these 20 ground out games, you know, 26 year outs of ground outs and strikeouts, you're not going to win too many ball games. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how the new approach can affect the Fridays and, and, and some of these guys who you wouldn't expect to dominate us. And it seemed like it was the eighth inning and we had four hits and one run. Uh, we want to be hit, uh, putting the ball in play. Strikeouts and ground outs are not going to get us anywhere. Carl, I think you're still muted. New computer. I've got to get used to all this. <laughs> Here we go. All right. JUCOs. I'm interested in seeing how the JUCOs perform this year. We've got uh, Tanner Gordon and Carter Bridge in particular, who had a uh, really, really solid fall performances and uh, really looking to see what they're going to contribute. Um, we've got a lot of other new faces, including uh, Brad Busald, uh, Grant Richardson, uh, Alex Franklin, um, and then the rest of the freshmen, Jeff Holtz, Michael Dung, Brookleberger, uh, Tyler Van Belt. Um, we've got Braden Tucker, Matt Litwicky, Gabe Beerman, uh, who, who got a shout out, uh, Jake Skrine, and McCade Brown. So a huge number of new players. We've got a some experience coming back in the JUCOs, and we've got some uh, solid uh, freshmen coming in. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what, uh, what they can accomplish. So uh, a staple of our weekly show uh, last year was our weekly player awards. <laughs> Unfortunately, the bucket hats we named them after have migrated south to Starkville, Mississippi with Coach Lamonis. So, Chris, are we ready to reveal the new name of the weekly awards? We're going to need a drum roll first, Carl. Okay. I think I'm a little bit faster on this one than I was in my uh, – First description here. Let's see. <laughs> we are going to go with the red belts. Okay. For, if you're any first time listeners, you didn't catch it last year. We gave out basically helmet stickers like they would in college football. And we used the limo hats to do that. And the limo hats would add up into the season awards. You know, the Joey Donato award, the Alex Dickerson award for hitting the Tony Butler award for defense and this year, we're going to go with the red belts. Uh, it's definitely something they need, it seems like. You know, <laughs> many, many seem to break. Cassie's going to explain to us uh, exactly why, though, red belts are the choice. Yeah, so as Chris mentioned, particularly last season, the team saw a lot of their red belts breaking. It, it happened all the time, particularly on the base, base pads. And so these red belts to us, the red belts breaking represent hustle plays. They represent players going all out in their play, whether that's on the mound, in the field, or at the plate. And, and so that's why we, we went with the red belts. We thought that was an appropriate, appropriate uh, representation for the weekly awards. So Josh, who are your favorites for the awards this season? Okay, Cass, I'll start with the Donato Award. I think many will immediately look to Polly, and there's no fault in that. Um, but I think I'm going to go go with either Cal or Cam this year. I have a feeling both of those guys are going to be put into situations this season that will ultimately decide how well this team does, with Cal coming in towards the end of the game in a really tough spot, and with Cam having a weekend start that will probably decide a win or a loss for the series. Um so for the Dickerson Award, I'm going to go with Kalitha or Bradley. Season where both of those guys put the team on their backs. Uh, I know there were plenty others that did that also, but I'm really looking forward to big things. And what's Logan's senior season and should have been Scotty's without the red shirt. So, but he's got that time there and put in the work and the maturity. So I think those two guys are going to stand out offensively. And then for the Butler Award, uh, Ryan Feynman will probably deserve this from what he does behind the scenes that isn't picked up on, but I'm going to pick the duo I expect to see the most of up the middle in Houston or Walker. Uh, you guys know I'm partial to middle infielders, um, 
But uh, I've been really impressed with both of those two since I saw them play the first time. They're both incredibly smooth defenders and excellent athletes. Uh, since this award usually goes to a web gem play, they might be penalized for making things look a little too easy. But uh, those are my guys for the defensive award this season. Uh, so, Carl, who do you have? Well, uh, I am going pretty uh, standard for the Donato Award. I'm going with Polly Milto. Uh, I think Fridays are going to be critical, and uh, Milto is going to be up to the task. And I think he's going to he's going to be a big dominant force, uh, particularly if he's if he's on Fridays. I do have a little bit of a sleeper pick. That would be Tommy Summer. I think there's opportunities for uh, for Tommy to really come in and make. Uh, make a huge splash, whether that's in midweeks, whether it's uh, in long relief, whatever role he ends up in, I think he has an opportunity to, to, to make a splash. Um, for the Dickerson Award, uh, I'm going with Matt Lloyd. I, I think he's about ready to just blow up and explode. I think we're going to see something amazing out of Matt Lloyd uh, this, uh, this year. Um, my sleeper would be Scotty Bradley. I don't know how much of a sleeper that is, uh, he, you know, by the numbers, he was pretty phenomenal last year. Um, but like uh, Cass mentioned last year, he's made some he's made some gains, and if he can continue with that, uh, he has some opportunities. Uh, for the Butler Award, I'm going with Matt Gorski. Um, it may be a poor pick just because of what he, of what uh, Josh said that he might make things look so easy that uh, he just doesn't have a bunch of opportunities to make splashy plays. Um, but uh, my other pick for that one is I'm going to agree with Josh and I'm going to go with, uh, with Jeremy Houston, who does have uh, always has some pretty impressive web gems. Uh, Chris, what do you have? Okay. For the Joey Donato award, I'm going to go with Tanner Gordon and I'm still not uh, convinced he's not a Friday night guy, but I guess we're going to probably find out tomorrow. Um, I didn't hear coach say anything in the last media sessions that told me he wasn't, but we'll find out. Um, I'm figuring you get four or five belts, you're pretty much up there for the award. And I think Gordon's going to have some real special games this year. Uh, for a sleeper pick, I went with Cal. And that's more of the approach that Mercer spoke about as far as, you know, go to who you trust late in the games. I could see him coming in maybe for three innings on Friday and two innings on Sunday in some real high-pressure spots and winning himself a couple of belts. Um, again, it's going to take probably four or five red belts to win the award by the end, if not more. Kaleta was winning them every week last year, but um, I don't think someone's going to get like eight or nine belts this year like Kaleta did, um, you know, last year. But those would be mine for the Donato. For the Tony Butler Award, speaking of Kaleta, I'm going to go with Logan. Uh, he's just the talent out there in the outfield. It, it's special. It's a special talent. His, his ground that he covers, balls he can get to. Not that Gorski isn't great either, but we saw him shine even in that fall ball game. Boy, he got to that ball at the wall. That was pretty incredible stuff. But I'm going to go with Kaleta. Uh, I think he'll have more special plays, like we said, the web gems, stuff like that. For a sleeper in that department, I have Justin Walker. He's smooth, man. He is smooth with the leather. He's fun to watch. And I, I don't know. He might be our starting shortstop. I'm not convinced he's not either. His bat might get him that spot. I'm not sure. You know, maybe the fact that he's a switch hitter. We don't really have the middle infield spot set up yet. I would think it's going to be between Houston, Walker, uh, Ashley, Bennell, something like that. If, to hear Coach Mercer talk about all the alternating, too, that could cut down on how many belts people get, right? Because it's going to be a lot of back and forth that you might not start as many games as you did last year. But he'll be my sleeper. Then for the Alex Dickerson, you know, call me the truck favorite guy, but I have this guy number seven. Uh, I feel like Matt Gorski might have a good offensive season, so I'm going to take him. And for a sleeper, I'm going to take Drew Ashley because you could, you know, you get the big hit in the eighth inning because he smacks the ball the other way or he lays down a huge bunt or he, uh, I don't know, steals a big bag. I feel like Ashley... I guess stealing a bat would have anything to do with hitting. But, you know, he can get do so many things with that bat that I'm going to have Ashley as my sleeper. Um, that's pretty much going to wrap up the award previews. But obviously, you know, we're just making guesses here. Their belts will be won on the field. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is a brand new segment we're going to try to keep going every week this year as long as questions keep coming in. And that's going to be the mailbag section. Uh, we had three questions come in for the season preview. So we're going to kind of give one out each, 
And our first one was from John. Uh, he actually sent it in via Instagram. And he's asking, what might the 2019 lineup look like as far as starting lineup? And that question is going to go to Josh. Wow. Thanks for giving me the easy one, Feeney. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I appreciate the heads up that this one was coming because, yeah, I needed to look into this one a little bit. Uh, this is such a tough question with the new coach coming in and not knowing how he likes to balance the lineup. Uh, every coach is different in how they do things. Some like a nine hole hitter that's a double lead off. Some like a bat control guy in the two hole. Well, there's want some pop in that spot. And as you just talked about, um, Coach Mercer said in the first media availability a couple weeks ago, there are going to be so many moving parts with this team. A lot of guys are so versatile. They'll have multiple positions. And with as many bats that I see on this roster, um, he'll want to get those guys worked in and get keep them fresh. Uh, so it's likely that we don't see the exact same lineup, um, even for any any back-to-back -back game or from a Friday to a Sunday, uh, especially before conference play starts, I think we're probably going to see a different lineup every every time out. Uh, so here's my stab at what I think the lineup will be for the opener on Friday. After that, hey, don't don't look back on this one. Um, but this is what I'm going to go with. Um, I'll have uh, Logan Cleet the leading off in left field. Uh, Matt Lloyd batting second at third base. Matt Gorski batting third in center field. Scotty Bradley at first base, batting cleanup. Ryan Feynman catching in the five spot. Uh, Elijah Dunham is DH in six. Uh, batting seventh, uh, Grant Richardson in right field. Um, batting eighth, uh, Walker at second base. And then Jeremy doing a, a double leadoff spot that short. Um, like I said, this is just a stab from if you look back at that, it's right, left, right, left right left right left switch so you know it's that's it's hard to how hard to predict this when we don't when we don't know how mercer's gonna do it after we watched uh coach lamonis fill out a lineup we kind of could get a feel on it but uh that's that's a tough a tough question there um so cass uh brian wants to know who we think uh the starting pitchers are going to be the, you to take that one yeah so so kind of piggybacking off what Josh was saying. I think what this looks like the first two to three weeks of the season is going to probably be pretty different from what we see to end. Um, just based on what Coach Coach Mercer was saying during the, the media availability. Um, I think Polly Milto is a pretty safe choice as a starter. Um, and I think Tanner Gordon, Tommy Summer, Andrew Saul, Frank, and probably Cam Beecham are all competing for the other starter spots. Um, I I could see Polly starting Friday. I could see Tanner starting Friday. I get, I I'm not really sure who's going to start when in the weekend. And I think whoever, whichever of the the uh, pitchers I named, are not in the weekend rotation they will probably be the midweek starters. So so those those are my bets for starters. But again, what we see these first couple of weeks, I think is going to be very, very different from what the end of the season looks like. So Carl, uh, Tara K1111 sent in what are the chances of the Hoosiers hosting a regional and is it realistic? My answer is the chances are probably actually a little better than they were this time a year ago. Um, I wouldn't, I was more optimistic last year than I am, than I necessarily would come out and say, but, uh, but looking back on it, the, the biggest struggle that the Hoosiers had was in conference. And I think it's become very, very clear that for a Big Ten team to host, and, and history backs me up on this, you have to win the Big Ten regular season title. So I can talk RPI till I'm blue in the face. And I'm going to on this podcast over the next few months. But that is only a component. A Big Ten title is going to be part of it. And you've got... Uh, two teams 
that are that a lot of program that a lot of uh, media are p- picking above Indiana um, in the league, and that's Michigan and Minnesota. Uh, but the name you don't hear a lot is Purdue, uh, and Purdue has the great benefit of not playing Michigan, Minnesota, or Indiana in the Big Ten Conference. So if Purdue were to be the fourth best team in the league, Purdue could possibly win 2021 20, games in the league. Uh, and that uh, would be a, a big task to try to get a, get ahead of them. Now, if Purdue is only the seventh best team in the league, you're probably only looking at 19 wins in the conference out of 24, which is still a very solid, solid performance. Uh, requires winning basically every series and then sweeping three of them. So that is, uh, I think winning the conference is the biggest piece of that. And then you got to, you got to pair that up with 40, with a 40 win season. So you get a 40 win season and win the conference. Uh, I think the chances, I think the team has the ability to do it. And both of those things, I think goes to what Chris said earlier, which is they're going to have to win on Friday nights. You, you can't lose half of your Friday games and most of your Friday games in conference and accomplish what I just talked about. Plus the, the pressure it puts on having to win Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. I feel like we were put in a hole so much last year, even against teams that really we didn't think we'd be fighting to really not sweep, right? I mean, how many yeah. Fridays did that happen? It's got to be. It's got to be fixed. I really hope that this new approach really affects it. Um, I know we're losing two big power hitters, though, with Miller and Sowers gone. Yeah. So uh, I think this offense isn't built around the home run anyway, though. Right. And if you look at it from that perspective, that that also might mean that we're not going to be quite as dominant on Saturday and Sunday as this team was last year, because it's not about getting that one that one mistake pitch and hitting the three run homer. So. Well, um, so with that, uh, we uh, were ready to talk about the start of the season. And the Hoosier baseball season begins with a road series against Memphis Tigers this weekend. Uh, Chris, will you give us some details on the Hoosiers' first opponent? I am so happy to. Baseball games are here again. Um, first, I really wanted to thank Austin Cangelosi, Ryan Halstead, and Kyle Hart for uh, talking some Hoosier baseball over the offseason. It really helped pass the time. Uh, but no offense, guys. I am glad the games are here. Uh, our first series is on the road. <laughs> Big shock, right? Uh, a whole lot of our first series and games will be on the road. This one, though, is a little different. I feel like normally we start out in these tournament settings where we might face three opponents, um, you know, one each different day. And this one, I, I can't really – I think Stanford might be the last time when we went out, uh, Coach Lemo's first season, when we played Stanford for that series. So it's been a little while where we haven't gone out into a tournament setting to open the season. So I'm definitely looking forward to this. It's the Memphis Tigers. They were 20 and 36 last season. They finished last in the AAC, the American Athletic Conference. Not a lot of people know that much maybe about that conference. It was a pretty good baseball conference. Um, They usually put quite a few teams in the tournament, but they were dead last. They were 12 and 19 at home, and that's FedEx Park. That's where the Hoosiers will be playing. Uh, Holds 2,000 people. Uh, from what I understand, it's pretty tight down each line. And if the wind's blowing out to left, it can, it can, the balls can fly out of there. Carl mentioned this before we came out live, though. With 50-degree uh, weather and possibly a little bit of rain, you never know. I don't know if think it's going to be a band box, but we'll see. Uh, the games are at 5 p.m. Eastern on Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, and 2 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. Memphis baseball, luckily enough, has provided us – Looks like with an audio link and a video link, both are free. So that's going to be cool. Uh, So no word on if Indiana University is going to provide any play-by-play. Of course, it's a possibility, but we haven't heard about that yet. Now, I tried to reach out to the SID of Memphis. Uh, It was a little hard to get in touch with him. I tried to reach out with him through social media and a few other ways. Couldn't get in touch. I guess he was pretty busy, but uh, I did some research on Memphis instead on my own. And it looks like they have hired a new director of player personnel, Jason Mott of the Cardinals. So he was hired for this season. So that might, you know, fire them up a little bit, get them a little bit more uh, focused in for a better season. But I don't know the talent. I mean, you'll see the season preview we're putting out later. The talent on the field, really, we should be dominating them. 
Um, with that record that they had last year, they're losing their Friday night guy. He got drafted by the Royals. They're losing their closer, and they're losing one of their better bats. And this was a team that finished 20 and 36. You know what I mean? So this is, this is a business trip. You know, we called a few different tournaments last year and, and a few different series business trips last season. And, and this is one of those type. I did uh, take a look at the pitching. Their coach announced their Friday and Saturday guy. Friday is going to be Hunter Smith. He had a 3.08 ERA last year. He did have 63 Ks to go against 15 walks. And uh, he held opponents to a 250 batting average. I believe he was their Sunday guy. So he'll now be the Friday. Then we have Alex Hicks. He seemed to be a midweek guy last year. He pitched to a 6 4 4 ERA. I don't know. We should hit him pretty good. And Sunday, there's just no starter announced. As far as uh, what offense they do have left, it looks like they're going to rely on some infielders, uh, upperclassmen, two seniors, Kale Henneman. He led the team last season with a 300 bat on average. He's back. Kyle Owlett. He is a senior first baseman. He had three home runs and 31 RBIs last year. That three home runs, though, was the second most on a team. And the guy they're most excited about is their junior shortstop, Alec Trella. He led the team last year with seven homers and 39 RBIs. So it seems like that's the bats they're looking to trust, you know, for this season. But really, I, I mean, I, I think I, in the actual series preview, I wrote, you know, this should be a series win at the least. But let's sweep this thing, man. Let's come home 3-0. You know, then head back to Tennessee to go to Knoxville, which is a different story, you know, that SEC team. But this this one, this one we need to take care of business. I know it's a new system and everything, but the talent's there. The talent's definitely there for this team. If you are going to the games, as far as alumni from Memphis, they were slim pickings, I got to be honest. Dan Ugla, he actually played in MLB. He's a Memphis alum, so he might be there. Penny Hardaway, obviously, he's now coaching the basketball team. They're on the road, though, so you won't see him. And from what I understand, though, he's not a Memphis alum, but he does live in Memphis. Morgan Freeman uh, is a big sports fan for the Memphis teams. So you might see Morgan there. You never know. Uh, I guess we'll have to see. But I'm really excited. If any alumni are in town, if anybody's making the trip, you know, support the Hoosiers on the road. They usually travel pretty well. Uh, I, I just, <laughs> these days can't, you know, what are we down to? Tomorrow I get to put to the two days to go and one day to go and it's, it's over. The countdown's over. Everything's over. Let's play some ball. Excellent. Uh, do we have any final thoughts from the panel today? Okay. Well, with that, uh, that'll do it for this special for this uh, edition, this preview edition of Talking Hoosier Baseball. Uh, read up on Indiana Baseball at iubase.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter at cu at the Bart and at iubase seventeen. Uh, please leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. For Cassidy Palmer, Josh Bennett, and Chris Feeney, I'm Carl James. See you at the BART. <laughs>